In this video I would like to talk about interactive music, in particular the relationship between live piano and live electronics. Piano and electronics have been at the heart of my composition since over 20 years now and I've written a few compositions where the relationship between the piano and the electronics were explored. The first work was Das Bleier a Klavier where I explored the possibility of an ever-changing prepared piano without having any preparations inside. And that composition led then in 2007 to Zellenlinien. As we can see in the beginning of the piece, the timing is very free. We have these big chords followed by fermatas. The electronics follow the pianist with an amplitude detection. And then on the second system, we have this section where the pianist is playing with repeated E and listens to a sequence of chords in the electronics. And in each of these repetition moments, he or she has a certain number of elements how to play that repeated E and can change the order. So there is an interaction between the electronics playing the sequence of the chords. When the first chord gets repeated in the electronics, that's the moment when the pianist is almost playing an echo to the electronics. So I'm inverting the typical relationship of a delay line where we have the instrument first and then the electronics repeat what the instrument microphone has picked up. So here we have a delay line in the other way around. The electronics is playing the chord first and the pianist is making the answer. In 2010, I composed Irrgarten for two pianos and electronics. This was a commission in remembrance of 40 years of the composition of Mantra by Stockhausen. And my work somehow relates to Stockhausen's work, not directly by picking notes or chords, but in its theatralic ambition and in certain ways the form and memory works throughout the composition. In this work, I wanted to hide the electronics pretty much as much as possible. And I worked with iOS devices, which were then feeding into speakers 
the speakers being inside the piano, I mean inside the resonant chamber of the piano and therefore the sound should melt as much as possible between the electronics and the live part. After spending three months in Japan in 2014, I composed Shadow of Bells. I was visiting many Japanese temples, gardens, and was fascinated by um, their view on certain aspects of nature and how the sounds of the bells would reverberate throughout nature and throughout the surroundings of temples. In this composition, the electronics are played back through two speakers below the piano directed towards the soundboard and exciting the soundboard and then four speakers surrounding the audience creating virtual spaces through large reverb spaces <laughs> Virtual Bodies is a work I started a few years ago. It's a work in progress. I have performed it a few times. It is the exploration of the relationship of the musical texture, which has a lot of freedom for improvisation, and then a live electronics, which is rendered in real time. So there's no tape, there's no pre-recorded material. Everything depends on the playing of the pianist in that very moment. So um, in successive performances, I would change the central pitch of the piece. So sometimes I'm playing it around an A, sometimes a B flat, sometimes a B, and the entire electronics follow that pitch and adapt to um, the current played pitch. Here's a short excerpt. <laughs> Thank you. 
So in these short excerpts, we could already hear that each piece explores a different way of relating the piano to live electronics. What I would like to talk about today is another work I'm composing right now called Sparks for piano and HNL electronics, which should be premiered this year, 2021 in July. Um, and while working on it, and obviously not just only working on this piece, but kind of um, all those pieces over the years have contributed to this um, thinking and these questions, I'm investigating what actually the interaction is. So we talk about interactive music. So what is the interaction between the instrumental part, the instrumental gesture, the pianist gesture and the electronics. And I have observed for many years that a lot of interactive music, mine included, is not so much interactive. A lot of what we call interactive music is more reactive actually. So a musician is playing something, the microphone is picking up the signal, and at some point the electronics, either at that very moment or a few seconds later or a few minutes later, the electronics are reacting to what the musician has done. So I want to show a few explorations, not solutions, they're just um, pathways where I'm currently am and where I'm researching to find new ways for myself and hopefully this is of interest. I assume that most of you are fam familiar with delay lines. The microphone is picking up a signal and plays it back a few seconds later or longer time spans like in works by, so uh, by Stockhausen Solo where very long tape loops were used back then. Now we have computers with, which have a lot of memory and we can make very long delays. Um, what the question then is, what is pertinent to our memory? So how long we can actually keep something in memory to recognize it as a one-to-one -one copy. And it's very interesting when we start improvising with a delay line. So just microphone in, delay line, and the signal comes back a few seconds later. So there is a very interesting feedback going on when that delay becomes, let's say, longer than seven or 10 seconds. We can then, we have already as an improvising musician generated more material and those 10 seconds ago almost have fallen away. And so being represented with this material becomes something very stimulating. Now here I'm working with something which is a kind of an extension of the idea of a delay line where I'm recording sounds into a buffer. Assume that this is our buffer. So we can record our waveform into it. And obviously the examples I showed today, they work very well for piano. They would work well for any instrument which has a, sh a clear attack. So percussion might be a good example. Um, because I'm relying on attack detection. So I'm looking when we have a new note coming in. So while I'm playing something, I'm detecting if there was a new attack. So let's just assume that these are moments when a new note was played. And I'm writing them into a buffer. What we see here now is the red graph is our waveform and the white lines are the detected moments when a new note came in. So I have a playback mechanism where those segments in the memory of the computer are now numbered. So I know these are my notes and their beginning and ending times in milliseconds. So I know that this is my first segment, my second segment, etc. I can now change the tempo and you already hear it. We are actually in kind of an atturando, retardando mode where the loop gets slower or faster. 
I'm not doing time stretch here because we are very sensitive to the attacks of piano notes, so the hammer noise. If I stretch that out, it's not very believable. I'm also not going this through the spectrum. I'm actually doing this only on the waveform where I'm just figuring out where to start. And then I can say, okay, instead of doing them in sequence, I can just pack ra pick random uh, order or kind of a drunk walk through the notes I've played. If I speed that up quite a bit, So we hear it becomes almost like a variation engine. And what I want to demonstrate now is um, how I play this on the piano. I'm just improvising a few notes. And we will have actually two engines running in tandem. So one is recording and detecting the attacks. And then once that has detected a certain number of attacks, in this case, I'm asking for nine. So after nine new notes, this engine will go into playback mode and then the lower engine will start recording and they will kind of alternate between. When investigating the relationship between an instrument and the electronics in real time, we need to investigate also what kind of information we can deduct from the microphone signal. So we have seen one example of amplitude. Let's look into pitch now. So what can we actually know about the currently played notes on a piano? Tracking the polyphonic piano is not an easy task. It is not like investigating the sound of a flute or an oboe or the human voice where we have normally just one single note at a time. And we can look into the spectrum of that particular note and deduct the fundamental frequency. On the piano, things are a little bit more complicated. Um, first of all, we play more than one note, but also the sound itself, when the very moment the hammer strikes the string um, the sound itself is very noisy. So a lot of notes in the same register have a lot of similar qualities in the first 20 to 30 milliseconds due to the hammer noise. So we can then delay that analysis and saying, okay, I'm looking a little bit later and there I'm making an analysis. But then if we want to play something at the very same time together with the note played on the piano, then there's always this time lapse. There's nothing to do about it. We can't look into the future, so we don't know if a note was played unless we hear it. And we have to work around the attack point. Now, obviously, uh, the polyphonic side of a piano is more complicated. So what I've been able to use was tapping into the research of a group at the University of Huddersfield under the guidance of Pierre-Alexandre Tremblay. It's called the FLUCOMA, the Fluid Corpus Manipulation Research. And for the past years, we have been looking into the analysis of sounds, the segmentation of sounds, and also the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence to do some of this. So I can't go obviously into all the details, but for those who are interested, you can continue the research um, and read about it. What I'm talking about now is the so-called NMF, the nonlinear matrix factorization. And I've used this 
to train a model. So let's imagine that we have a piano here. I mean, this is a physical piano, but it sounds like a real piano. And I am training a neural network repeatedly different incarnations, let's say, of an A4, played with different dynamics, played on different types of pianos, on a Steinway, of an upright piano, on a Bösendorfer, played with different tuning systems, I mean, diapason tunings, 440, 442, etc. And I present this neural network with all these different versions of an A4 and say, learn that this is an A4. And what we obtain is at the end kind of a database. So here we have all the analyzed notes of the piano. And you could think of it that each of these spectra we see here now are kind of the fingerprint, the acoustic fingerprint for that particular note. So obviously this training has been offline um, and I'm not training the very low octave of the piano because then I would need a much higher FFT size and that incorporates even longer delays. So um, what I'm working with is in total 73 notes from C2 to the highest note of the piano. And what this gives me at the end is a tracking patch. So I get my microphone in here and in the tracking, I'm using then an NMF matching object from that research group. Um, I'm telling it that we have 73 components. And what that object gives me is a list for these 73 components with their likelihood that this note is part of the total spectrum. So if I play just one note, it's pretty likely that that particular pitch is the highest candidate. If I'm playing more than one pitch, then due to overtones um, and overlap of some spectra, there might be more than just that one single note being played. I have a few ideas even to increase or in, in, uh, to improve this model, but for now it is what it is. It is certainly not ideal. It's not like playing on a MIDI piano, um, but what I'm after is a piano, I mean, a technology which only relies on the microphone. So hopefully this can then be played in different concert halls with different pianos, but not relying on the technical requirement of a MIDI piano, I mean a grand piano with MIDI function. So after getting this list of all the activations, I mean the likelihoods that a certain pitch was there, I'm doing all kinds of filtering to convert them into individual notes. So I have then these 73 note filters here and each of them is looking at that particular activation channel. And if it, the activation is high enough, it generates a MIDI note. So what we have here is now the microphone coming in and I'm sending this currently to a little playback patch which uses Serge Le Mouton's sampler. So it's a sampler within Max. So I've loaded samples of the piano. So that would be just our A4. And what I can do now is I'm playing some notes on the piano and we will trigger at the same time the notes from this um, sampler. examples I will do some symbolic note transformations. I'm not transforming the sound of the piano. I am detecting the piano pitch through this module I just explained and then I'm going into symbolic representation. The first example will be the generation of chords. Chords with particular qualities taken or built off of the detected pitch.
an extension of that is what I call cloud. So it's actually little groups of notes. The next example is what I call a stubborn delay. So it detects a pitch and then repeats that note in an irregular rhythm. The next example is what we call Agogik. So this is based on a library which extends the Bach library by Daniel Gysi and Andrea Agostini. Um, the library is called Cage and it's kind of a higher level musical library based on Bach. Here we have functions like Agogik, so we can record a musical figure and then repeat it with increasing or decreasing temporal evolution. And this is a time warp where a melody is recorded and then the order and duration of notes is constantly reorganized. I'm putting all of those modules on, but as you will see, they have all their own individual timer and come in and out and at some point overlap and generate something I can't fully anticipate. So that is actually then again this question of interaction. So while I'm playing some music material and I hear that transformed back, I get inspired to generate responses to what the computer is proposing. The next example shows another playback patch, not so dissimilar from a typical sampler. So I've loaded many sounds from Prepare Piano. And I just want to show a little bit the playback engine before I'm connecting it to the real piano. So let's say we have just a pretty standard playback of a scratch note. So this is a scratch on the strings. And then I have a few playback modes so I can play this backwards. No surprise. It starts from the tail and goes to the beginning. And then I have a mode where I'm generating loop points on the fly so the loop will actually never repeat and it makes a loop back and forth between um, I mean the direction is changing so you hear sometimes the glissando going up sometimes down and if I play polyphonically then each voice has its own looping In this mode I'm respecting the note on and note off, so if I play a note and then release the note, um, the note on and off are respected, but I can also put it into a mode where I'm only triggering the note and then I'm generating some duration here artificially. Let's say I'm making a note which is now five seconds long and over that duration it will loop. And then I can also induce 
an additional glissando. So I can say you start with no glissando at the beginning and you have to gliss up a certain amount and the duration of the glissando. Let's make it five seconds also. So now we started at the original pitch and then it glides up. Let's take a different sound. Um, I recorded sounds with a piece of rubber on the lower strings. It makes this very high pitched resonant sound. So this would be the original sound. No glissando. So if I combine that with the piano, I will now generate a longer note. So let's say some thing between five and 10 seconds, and then each note can either gliss down for a certain amount or gliss up for a certain amount. And the glissando can also between five and 10 seconds. The last version I want to show, or the last option here I have is that if I'm choosing more than one sound, let's say I'm taking um, some preparation with rubber that would sound originally like this. And then I'm choosing a second sound. Let's turn off the can now aleatorically choose which sound to take. So if I'm making a long list here, then each new note can pick any of those samples. In this example, I will now combine these concepts. We have two instances of the sample player. The upper one is loaded with four longer sounds, so bowed sounds and this rubber sound I showed earlier. So if I just play this one, let's just trigger one sample. So we hear these different types of sounds and each of them can have a very slight glissando. This sampler receives its pitch directly from the pitch tracker. And the second instance is loaded with very short sounds. But obviously because those are prepared piano sounds, we don't always get the same pitch. So we get kind of a pitch center, but not necessarily the exact pitch. And this sampler is not receiving the pitch directly from the pitch tracker. The pitch tracker is sending the pitch first into this real time module here. And I'm using the stubborn delay. So I'm detecting a pitch and generate this series of the same pitch with a re irregular rhythm, which then sends its signal back, I mean the information, back to the second sampler. So if I'm playing a note here, you're getting this cloud of ever-changing, randomly picked notes from this collection here. So let's combine both and play some notes on the piano. So as one could hear, I'm passing the microphone signal through a gate. So I'm only taking sounds louder than a certain dynamic here, in this case minus 65 dB. So I can play pianissimo notes on the piano and they're not getting into the detection and therefore not triggering, not each note is then triggering a new sound from those samplers. To finish with the individual sound examples, I want to show one more module 
and combine it with what we just saw before as particularly the playback of these sampled sound files doesn't always match up with the sound of the real piano in the room i'm overlaying many of the treatments with some treatment of the real sound of the real microphone sound of the piano so here is now an audio version of this stubborn delay so this result kind of inspired me to program something similar but now based on the audio so i'm detecting when a sound had been played and then i'm repeating it like with a delay line so I could actually pretty much mimic a delay line here. So, and let's say, okay, I want 10 repetitions. Now, what you hear, there's also already in Ritodando Accelerando going on. You also hear that there's a filter. So I'm not fading the sound out with its amplitude. I'm fading it away through a filter. And then I can create more than one voice. Now, right now they have all their same rhythm, but if I dissociate these voices and each voice can have their own rhythm and give them a slight transposition so they can now also glide up or down and each of them can have a different number of repetitions. So there we hear the clear color of that particular piano and now I will combine it with the overlay of the sampler. To conclude, I would like to talk a moment about notation for the upcoming work Sparks for Piano and HN Electronics. I'm experimenting with ways how to notate the musical fabric. So on the left side would be a standard notation and the pianist would be partially busy in counting and trying to match those tempi and still listening to the electronics. The right side is a proportional notation containing exactly the same musical content. And the timing would be up to the pianist. There could be moments where he or she takes more or less time depending on what the electronics are rendering. Now, as the electronics are recalculated during the performance every time anew, and there's no fixed media, I'm searching for this space, for this interpretation space for the pianist to be in dialogue, to be in interaction with that musical fabric. So depending on how long a certain musical texture from the computer lasts or how strong is the resonance or all these different aspects of the electronics, how polyphonic the result is, um, they depend to a good degree on the intensity and the pitches the pianist is playing, but also there is a lot of room to regenerate with the exact same musical input from the pianist, something slightly different. So I'm 
interested in exploring these slight differences and to give the pianist the way to play, to interact with it. I've explored in other works the possibility of giving musical material to the musicians. Um, this is an example from codification memory for soprano, percussion, nine instruments and electronics. And what we see here are these brackets where musicians are giving precise musical material, but the order of the material is free. And then there is an overarching time frame within which everybody is performing these actions, very often with overarching dynamic profiles over the duration of this event. And then it basculates back into normal metered notation. So these kind of two modes of dealing with time are interesting to me. The last musical example is this exact passage played freely while listening to the electronics, which for this video have been rendered into a stereo file and normally have a lot of spatial movement and spatial relationships.